Hey guys, how's it going? Paris is sniffing you. Let's see what we got going. Yeah, sniff away, Paris. Sniff away. Oh, you're so cute. Come here. Yeah. All right. So we're looking at digital forensics today. this part really I'll just make sure I'm in the right section here and I didn't skip any chapters or pages yeah oh, okay data acquisition and order of volatility oh hey how's it going there hello all right so we're looking at data acquisition. And so acquisition is a process of obtaining a forensically clean copy of data from a device held as evidence. If the computer system or device is not owned by the organization, there is a question of whether search or seizure is legally valid. You've seen that probably in a lot of articles about whether uh, companies like Amazon can give out Alexa recordings or uh, controversies about accessing phones that are locked. Uh, there's there's a lot of legality around this, and it's surprisingly getting more and more interesting. I don't know if you guys have been reading recently, but uh, Amazon basically doesn't admit or deny that they have uh, used Alexa to listen to people's conversations, which is not surprising. Uh, but the most interesting part is that the government is looking at seizing those recordings from Amazon. Uh, and they're actually, there's a subpoena that was issued by New Jersey, uh, a judge in New Jersey. So it's, it's actually looking really interesting to see where this goes. Cause at what point do you consider it an invasion of privacy? Um, so far, they've just been used in murder cases, but where does it stop? You know, um, so the legality of it is kind of back and forth. Uh, so um, what they're talking about is bring your own device policies. So when we're saying bring your own device, that means when you go to a company to work, you bring your smartphone from home and you use um, that smartphone to do stuff for your job, which honestly, um, not a good idea because company has its own appropriate I IP. So you have, if you have signed NDAs, non-disclosure agreements that you're not going to share information. Well, what happens when you quit your job? You keep that IP on your phone. Like, do they go through your phone and do you do a factory reset? Like just, kind of weird stuff like that like where do you go after you have already put work on your phone so um bring your own device policy is kind of i uh when my last job i had my my i called it my pleasure phone and i called it and then my business bought me an iphone which ugh, i hated but it was a business phone so that meant anything that i did on that phone they could see um and then also i could keep my work life separate from my private personal life which i think would have been better because they wouldn't see all this stuff in my personal life because i don't know if you've seen it but people have been fired for things in their personal life because they put it on their company device so just something to take into consideration when you guys get a job or you have a job right now um, about maintaining your your personal life separate from your business life. Uh, so for example, if an employee is accused of fraud, you must verify that employee's equipment and data can be legally seized and searched. Any mistake may make evidence gained from the search inadmissible. Now, a lot of companies, what they say with this is that your personal phone, because it has their information on it, 
it is theirs because it's got their IP on it. So that's another thing is they believe that they can seize your phone because you have, you know, some kind of IP from their company on there. So again, don't really like this. Um, I don't mind the like corporate owned, personally enabled, you know, that's just what I had the last job I was in. But yeah, just really, really tricky stuff right here. Um, and I would just recommend be really, really careful with bring your own device because it could come back and bite you really hard. Like, uh, so just be careful with that. So data acquisition is also complicated by the fact that it is more difficult to capture evidence from a digital crime scene than it is from a physical one. Some evidence will be lost. The computer system is powered off. So that's again why we were saying like, if you guys can keep it in the state that it was in whenever it was hacked, that is the best state for it to stay in because it's difficult when you turn off your computer and your RAM just goes and wipes the memory clean because then you can't see certain files, caches, packets because they just get dumped. So just something to take into consideration. On the other hand, some evidence may be unobtainable until the system is powered off. So it's kind of a catch-22 here. Um, so additionally, evidence may be lost depending on whether the system is shut down or frozen by suddenly disconnecting the power. So data acquisition, uh, another thing that's brought up too is um, operating systems. Sometimes if you power it off, it can, you know, rewrite itself, update, do all that kind of stuff. So it, I would say more often than not, powering it off is like the worst. I would say it's worse to power off than to power on, but they're, they're saying here that, well, it might, might not be. It just depends on the situation. Um, data acquisition usually proceeds by using a tool to make an image from the data held on the target device. An image can be acquired from either volatile or non-volatile storage. The general principle is to capture evidence in the order of volatility from more volatile to less volatile. The ISOC Best Practice Guide to Evidence Collection and Archiving published by tools.letf.org uh, sets out the general orders as follows. So you go to the CPU registers, cache memory, including cache on disk, controllers, GPUs, and so on. Contents of non-persistent system memory, RAM, right? Because RAM will wipe once you power off, uh, including routing table, ARP caches, process table, kernel statistics. Yeah, that ARP cache is super important because uh, ARP is how a computer says, I exist. And so if a hacker hacks into you or your program or whatever, they have to connect to your computer first. And they need to talk to the computer and say, hey, this is who I am, right? So ARP is super important. Data on persistent mass storage devices, HDDs, SSDs, and flash memory devices, partition and file system blocks, Slack space, and free space, system memory caches such as swap space, virtual memory, and hibernation files, temporary file caches such as the browse cache, user application and operating system files and directories, remote logging and monitoring data. <clears throat> Ooh. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. I wanted to kick up my feet. Uh, remote logging and monitoring data. Physical configuration and network topology. Archival media and printed documents. Windows registry is mostly stored on disk, but there are keys. Notably, HKLM hardware that only ever exists in memory. The contents of the registry can be analyzed via a memory dump. All right. Cool beans. So digital forensic software. Digital forensic software is designed to assist the acquisition documentation analysis of digital evidence. Most of the commercial forensic tools are available through Windows platform only. Oh, that's great. Well, Linux, sounds like you guys need to start working on something. Sorry. <laughs> 
So Encase Forensic is a digital forensics case management product created by Guidance Software. Case management is assisted by built-in pathways or workflow templates showing the key steps and diverse types of investigations. In addition to the core forensic suite, there are separate products for e-discovery, digital evidence management, and endpoint investigator. For over the network analysis of corporate desktop, oh, whoa. <laughs> I'm trying to prevent myself from falling over here. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Uh, digital evidence management and endpoint investigator for over the network analysis of corporate desktops and servers. Uh, forensic toolkit from access data is another commercial investigation suite designed to run on Windows Server or server cluster. The sleuth kit is an open source collection of command line tools and programming libraries for disk imaging and file analysis. Autopsy is a graphical front end for these tools and acts in a case management workflow tool. So I've seen Autopsy used by James. Um, I've not used any of these yet, though. The program can be extended with plugins for various analysis functions. Autopsy is available for Windows and can be compiled from the source code to run on Linux. Oh, that's cool. Props to you, Autopsy. WinHex from Xways is a commercial tool for forensic recovery and analysis of binary data with support for a range of file systems and memory dump types, depending on version. The volatility framework uh, is widely used for system memory analysis. Cool. System memory acquisition. System memory is volatile data held in random access memory modules. Volatile means that the data is lost when power is removed. Right, we, we already talked about this multiple times. A system memory dump creates an image file that can be analyzed to identify the processes that are running, the contents of temporary file systems, registry data, network connections, cryptographic keys, and more. It can also be a means of accessing data that is encrypted when stored on a mass storage device. There are various methods of collecting the contents of system memory. So we got live acquisition. A specialist hardware or software tool can capture the contents of memory while the host is running. Unfortunately, this type of tool needs to be pre-installed as it requires a kernel mode driver to dump any data of interest. Some examples for Windows include WinHex, Memorize from FireEye, and FResponse Tactical. On Linux, oh, I hit that link accidentally. On Linux, a user mode tool such as MemDump or DD can be run against the slash dev slash mem device file. However, on most modern distributions, access to this file is blocked. The volatility framework includes a tool to install a kernel driver pmem. The fmem and lime kernel units provide similar functionality. Crash dump. When Windows encounters an unrecoverable kernel error, it can write contents of memory to a dump file at c colon windows memory dot on modern systems, this is unlikely to be a complete dump of all the contents of memory as these could take up a lot of disk space. However, even many dump files stored in Windows, many dumps may be valuable source of information. Hibernation file and page file. Hibernation file is created on disk in the root folder of the boot volume when Windows host is put into a sleep state. It can be recovered, the data can be decompressed and loaded on into a software tool for analysis. The drawback is that network connections will have been closed and malware may have been detected the use of a sleep state and perform anti-forensics. Page file swap file swap partition stores pages of memory in use that exceed the capacity of the host's RAM modules. The page file is not structured in a way that analysis tools can interpret, but it is possible to search for strings. Disk image acquisition. So the disk image acquisition refers to acquiring data from non-volatile storage. Non-volatile storage includes hard disk drives, solid state drives, firmware, other types of flash memory, USB thumb drives, and memory cards, and optical media, CD, and DVD, and Blu-ray. This can also be referred to as device acquisition, meaning that the solid state device storage in a smartphone or media player data disk acquisition will also capture the operating system installation of the boot volume is included. There are three device states for persistent storage acquisition. 
So we got live acquisition. This means copying data while the host is still running. This may capture more evidence or more data for analysis and reduce impact on overall services, but the data on the actual disks will have changed. So this method may not produce legally acceptable evidence. It may also alert the adversary and allow the time for them to perform anti-forensics. Yeah, if, if you modify the data in any way, shape, or form, uh, some if you got a, a good enough defense lawyer, they can make it non-admissible in court. So static acquisition by shutting down the host. This runs the risk for that the malware will detect the shutdown process, perform anti-forensics to try to remove traces of itself. Static acquisition by pulling the plug. This means disconnecting power at the wall socket, not the hardware power off button. This is most likely to preserve the storage devices forensically clean state, but there's risk of corrupting data. Yeah. If you guys have ever I accidentally pulled a plug on your computer and watched it die. You know what? Speaking of that, <clears throat> my computer is not charging right now. Okay. Oh, okay. I gotta get up. All right. Charge that. Oh, yes. Yes. I love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> I need some water. Give me some water. Yes. Oh. I'm really surprised with HP. That battery is still pretty good. It's wild. So I bought a laptop in, uh, I think it was 2013. Is that HP Envy? Things holding up well. It's okay, it's just the light. Oh. It's okay, Paris, it's just the light flashing. All right, so given sufficient time at the scene, you may decide to perform both a live and static acquisition. Whichever method is used, it is imperative to document the steps taken and supply a timeline for your actions. There are many GUI imaging utilities, including those packaged with suites, such as the Forensic Toolkit and its FTK Imager. You should note that the in-case forensic suite uses a vendor file format .e01 compared to the raw file format used by Linux tools like DD. The file format is important when it comes to selecting a tool for analyzing. Oh, hey, there's that. I forgot to throw that away. For analyzing something, the image. The .e01 format allows image metadata such as the checksum drive geometry and acquisition time to be stored within the same file. The open source advanced forensic format provides similar features. If no specialist tool is available on a Linux host, you can use the dd command to make a copy of an input file if is to an output file of, of is and apply optional conversions to the file data in the following SDA is the fixed drive dd if is dev slash SDA of is slash MNT slash USB stick slash backup dot IMG. Oh. A more recent fork of dd is DCFLDD, which provides additional features like multiple output files and exact match verification. So this is in Linux, right? They're using the DD command. So this is DCFLDD, a version of DD with additional forensics functionality created by the DOD and generating a hash of the source disk data. That's interesting. Okay.
Alrighty then. The Department of Defense created a command code in Linux. Makes you wonder what they're running. Hmm. <clears throat> Preservation and integrity of evidence, right? It is vital that the evidence collected at the crime scene conforms to a valid timeline. Digital information is susceptible to tampering, so access to the evidence must be tightly controlled. Recording the whole process establishes the provenance of evidence as deriving directly from the crime scene. To obtain a forensically sound image from non-volatile storage, you need to ensure that nothing you do alters da data or metadata properties on the source disk or file system. A write blocker assures the process by preventing any data on the disk or volume from being changed by filtering write commands at the driver and operating system level. Data acquisition would normally proceed by attaching the target device to a forensics workstation or field capture device equipped with a write blocker. Data acquisition with integrity and known repudiation. Once the target disk has been safely attached to the forensics workstation, data acquisition proceeds as follows. A cryptographic hash of the disk media is made using either the MD5 or SHA hashing function. Output of the function can be described as a checksum. A bit-by-bit -bit copy of the media is made using the imaging utility. A second hash is made of the image, which should match the original hash of the media. A copy is made of the reference image, validated again by the checksum. Analysis is performed on the copy. This proof of integrity ensures non-repudiation. If the provenance of the evidence is certain, the threat actor identified by analysis of the evidence cannot deny their actions. The checksums prove that no modification has been made to the image. In practical terms, the image acquisition software will perform the verification steps as part of the acquisition process, but in theory, you could use separate tools to perform each stage individually. Preservation of evidence. The host devices and media taken uh, from the crime scene should be labeled, bagged, and sealed using tamper-evident bags. It is also appropriate to ensure that, that all the bags have an anti-static shielding to reduce the possibility that data will be damaged or corrupted on the electronic media by electrostatic discharge. That, oh my gosh, man. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys, I can't remember which movie it is. I think it's like Journey to the Center of the Earth or something. But the the actor at one point to just kind of cover his tracks, he doesn't use electrostatic uh, discharge, but he does use magnetism, which... Those are legit means of destroying evidence, right? Um, uh, electronics do not handle static discharges very well. Um, I've actually seen a circuit card get fried uh, with just a um, multimeter set on the diode setting. Uh, and it sent 1.27 volts to a 500 millivolt system and just fried it. <laughs> no longer works. Uh, so, obviously, if you wanted to corrupt or damage your data, magnetism is pretty good. It was a powerful magnet. And then, you know, if you can get some electrostatic discharge off, uh, Good luck reading all that stuff, piecing it together. Each piece of evidence should be documented by a chain of custody form which records where, when, and who collected the evidence, who subsequently handled it, and where it was stored. The evidence should be stored in a secure facility. This means not mean, only means act, as access control, but also environmental control so that the electronic systems are not damaged by condensation, which is a super big deal too, right? If you have water building up inside that PC, yikes. ESG, fire, and other hazards. Yeah, fire would definitely fry it. Similarly, if the evidence is transported, the transport must also be secure. Acquisition of other data. There are other potential sources of forensic data within computer systems and networks, though they can be hard to acquire or to prove as admissible. Network. Packet captures and traffic flows can contain very valuable evidence that the capture was running at the right time and in the right place to record the incident, as with memory forensics. The issue for forensic lies in establishing the integrity of the data. Most network data come, will come from a 
System Information Event Manager. Cache. Cache can refer to hardware components or software. Software-based cache is stored in the file system and can be acquired as part of a disk image. For example, each browser has a cache of temporary files, and each user profile has a cache of temp files. Some cache artifacts generated by the operating system and applications are held in memory only, such as portions of the registry, crypt cryptographic keys, password hashes, some types of cookies, and so on. The contents of hardware cache, CPU registers, and disk controllers, read-write cache, for instance, is not gen generally recoverable. Artifacts and data. Artifacts refer to any type of data that is not part of the mainstream data structures of an operating system. For example, the Windows alternating data streams. Alternate data streams feature is often used to conceal file data in various caches, such as prefetch and mcache can be used to find indicators of suspicious process behavior. Data recovery refers to analyzing a disk or image of a disk or file fragments stored in Slack space. These fragments might represent deleted or overwritten files. The process of recovering them is referred to as carving. Snapshot, uh, snapshot is a live acquisition image. Of a persistent disk. Wow, this may have less validity than an image taken from a device using a write blocker. It may be the only means of acquiring data from a virtual machine or cloud process. Firmware. Firmware is usually implemented as flash memory. Some types, such as PC firmware, can potentially be extracted from the device or from the system using an imaging utility. It likely will be necessary to use specialist hardware to attach the device to a forensic workstation, however. Digital forensics for cloud. With an on-premises investigation, the right to seize and analyze data devices is usually fairly unproblematic. So they can take your server, but my clients were doing the bad stuff. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so that's why, like, one of the arguments for, for cloud is, uh, oh, you know, it's great because you have a third party deal with all the problems. Well, the problem is, is if you're on the same server as someone who is doing something bad and they need that for evidence. Well, there goes all your IP and property. So then you're left with litigation and trying to get your property back. And most of the time they say, well, when the investigation's over in like 14 months, you can get your property back kind of thing. So the, they can seize your server that you use for your cloud devices if somebody's doing something bad with it, right? So there may be availability issues with taking a system out of service and bringing your own device policies can be more complex. But essentially, yeah, so if somebody does something wrong, it's like, okay, well, we can take your phone. But essentially, as all the equipment is the company's property, there are no third-party obstacles. While companies can operate private clouds, forensics in a public cloud are complicated by the right to audit permitted to you by your service agree level agreement with the cloud provider. Two more issues with forensic investigations of cloud-hosted processing and data services are as follows. The on-demand nature of cloud services means that instances are often created and destroyed again with no real opportunity for forensic recovery of any data. Cloud providers can mitigate this to some extent with extensive logging and monitoring options uh, Cloud service provider might also provide an option to generate file system and memory snapshots from containers and VMs in response to an alert condition generated by a system information event manager. Chain of custody issues are complex and might have to rely on the cloud service provider to select and package data for you. The process should be documented and recorded as closely as, as is possible. Jurisdiction and data sovereignty may restrict what evidence the cloud service provider is willing to release to you. If the cloud service pro provider is a data processor, it will be bound by data breach notification laws and regulations, coordinating the time notification and contact with the regulator between your organization and the cloud service provider can be extremely complex, especially if there is an ongoing incident requiring confidentiality. Oh. You must recover the contents of the ARP cache as vital evidence of a man in the middle attack should you shut down the PC and image the hard drive to preserve it. No, you should not shut down the PC. 
No, the ARP cache is stored in memory and will be discarded when the computer is powered off. You can either dump the mem system memory or run the ARP utility and make a screenshot. In either case, make sure that you record the process and explain your actions. Boom. Which command line tool allows image creation from disk media on any Linux host? DD. Tool is installed on all Linux distributions. Yes, I got that. True or false? To ensure evidence integrity, you must make a hash in the media before making an image. True. Boom. Got it right. What type of forensic data is recovered using a carving tool? Ooh. Some carving tool. I'm not entirely sure about that one. Carving tool allows close inspection of an image to locate artifacts. Artifacts are data objects and structures that are not obvious from examination by ordinary file browsing tools, such as alternate data streams, cache entries, and deleted file remnants. No, I did not get that right. Ooh, look at my knowledge goal. Ooh, we're going to do some digital forensics now. You know what I just realized? I can use the really nice chair upstairs. So I'm just going to move everything upstairs real quick. Because that sounds like a good plan. Last time I did this, this did not go well. I have to juggle between all this stuff. So, let me do this. Save some power here. Sign out of here. Shut that down. Sorry, guys. I'm transitioning here. Ugh. But yeah, uh, I got my wife a secret labs Titan House Stark chair, and uh, I kind of like it just a little bit. It's only like the most comfy chair I've ever sat in for a computer chair. Um, it's not like a recliner, though. Ah! Did I hit no? Did I hit no? Oh, I went forward, backwards. So let's go forwards. Let's go here. Okay. 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 Okay, guys, give me a sec. Give me a sec. Oh, the lumbar support, though. Oh my gosh. I swear, like I, I am not being, uh, freaking, uh, sponsored by Secret Labs at all. Ah. Uh, but it feels so good. Like, seriously, like, and look at how gorgeous it is. Do you see this? Like, that is gorgeous, man. I love this chair. Like, so you got right here. Let me see if I'm doing this right. So you got right here. Let me see if I'm doing this right. Yeah, so you got right here the dire wolf, right? How stark. Winter is coming. The detail on this chair. Oh my gosh. Look at the back. Look at the back. And oh, yeah. Um it is pricey, I'm not gonna lie. But The way you feel on this chair after hours of sitting is you feel like a champ, all right? You feel like a million bucks. Like you feel like you put your money towards something that was it was a smart purchase. Oh, let me grab this one. Do it back, guys.
Oh, but yeah. If you guys are looking at another chair, uh, highly recommend looking at Secret Labs. Now I'm six foot five, right? So my only complaint, and I think that's why they made the XL. But my only complaint is I feel the stitching on the top headrest. If that makes sense. So I'm really, I'm a really lanky ape yeti sasquatch. Um, and so when I lean back, I feel the threads right here and it kind of annoys me. Like, I don't know if you guys can see it, but, but besides that, that's like my only complaint. Everything else feels amazing. Oh, sorry. I know I took a really long time on that, but, oh, such an amazing, amazing chair. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah, I love the man. It just feels so good. Every just most like the one thing right there. That's it. That's the one complaint I have. But I talked to my wife about it. I was like, babe, you know, if you're gonna be nice to me and get me one of these, I would like one as the Titan XL, which is a lot larger. It's made for heavier people. Um, uh, so I'm hoping that I can get a little bit wider, uh, but also a little bit taller. Not that I need wider, but I'm kind of one of those people that like slack. I like to feel tiny in what I'm in. Um, but yeah, just feels, feels good. But yeah, no way, shape or form am I being sponsored by secret labs. Just want to emphasize that. Um, <clears throat> also another company I really enjoy is, uh, Razor. Again, not sponsored, but I've had my death adder since 2013 and for a big guy like me, it just, it feels pretty good. The only complaint I have is these, this side button right here. No, the back button. I hit that so much and, uh, I just, I like the ergonomics of the mouse itself, but those two keys can really screw me over. So, and they're very finicky. The sensitivity on them is, is crazy, but it just feels really good when using it. All right, so we're in Assisted Lab 30, acquiring digital forensic evidence. As a digital forensics analyst, you should never work directly on the suspect hard disk drive. In this activity, you will use a built-in Linux command to duplicate the suspect disk. Next on Windows computer, you will use the carving tools provided with the open source forensic suite autopsy. Sleuthkit.org to investigate a disk image. You will open a pre-built case file and probe the information extracted to identify a malware installation event. This activity is designed to test your understanding of an ability to apply content examples of the following CompTIA Security Plus objectives. Given a scenario, use the appropriate tool to assess Organizational security, 4.5, explain the key aspects of digital forensics. All right, so we're gonna use Linux to create a disk image. A virtual hard disk drive containing possible evidence has already been attached to the PT1 Kali Linux virtual machine. You'll need to create a disk image and then provide, prove whether there have been unexpected changes to the file during the investigation. Linux contains a built-in tool named DD that can easily create copies of disks for forensics professionals. You will use DD to create an image. Next, you will use MD5 hashes to discover whether a file has changed unexpectedly. All right, so we're in Cali, right? You can see it right there. Whoa, what is up with, what am I on? Oh, hey, that's right there. I was like, why is my laptop all wobbly? All right. 
So, I just want to make sure real quick that if I haven't said hello to you, I say hello. Yes, and that works. Perfect. All right. So, as usual, uh, bad passwords, right? You have these rethink passwords. Um, all right, from the top bar, oh, we could just do control alt T. Okay, we're going to run the following command. So we're going to look for following file proc partitions. Okay, so we got a lot of data right there. Okay. So we got the disk information displayed. Two point nine gigs. Oh my gosh. And take <clears throat> all right. Well, So we're putting it into our root suspect. And we're making it an image. That's interesting. All right. So the image creation process will take several seconds. Okay. If the dev SCV driver larger, the process would take much longer. I need to get a hat because my hair keeps falling on my face. I don't like it when it falls on my face. We'll be right back, guys. Keeps out of my face. That's crazy. <laughs> so uh, I decided to try on a hat from like, when was it? Freaking during the Navy 2013. And I don't remember having to do two. 
I think my head got bigger. I don't know how that happened. My head got fatter. Oh my gosh. All right. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, dude, this feels so good. Oh wait. I'll be nice to this chair. Let's put it like this. All right. So. Um, we created the disk image file. Now we're running the MD5 sum command to generate a checksum and direct redirect it to a file. All right. All right, so we got a hash now. That's our hash for this file. Cool. So we made it, and then we just check to make sure it actually exists. And now we have to check that it exists through here. Oh, my neck. Oh, oh, that feels so good. Come on, babe, and make it hurt so good. Mm. Sometimes love don't be like you. Boom. All right. So to mark the image with today's date, run the following command. Echo. So we're going to use the md 5 sum command from the previous steps to hash the suspecting.img file again, but this time append the hash resulting results to the existing suspect.image hash file. You must enter the following command carefully or you will destroy the hash generated. For the original suspect.img file, note that the use of arrow arrow instead of one Double greater than signs append data to the file without overriding existing data. Okay, cool. That is good to know. Oh, sorry guys. Man, um, everything just decided to bloom. And I am allergic to all of it. All right, so get our double arrows. Use the cat command from the earlier steps to display the content. Cat command from earlier. This one. Hey, look, I got two hashes. And look, they're not the same. So I didn't screw it up. No. So we got two lines, each with a hash result. If the two results are the same, then the original suspect.image tag cache file has not changed. If the two results are different, then there was a change to the file during the time between and the two hashes were generated. In this case, the suspect.image file is evidence, so a change would be bad. 
run the following command to display the contents of the suspected dot image file. It appears that you accidentally overwrote the entire file. Oops. Wait, what? I thought you guys were leading me down a good path. Hence, the hashes are different. This is an extreme example of the risks of working directly with evidence. As you saw the original content, look at it dev slash stb. You use dd to create another image file. Had you been working directly with this content, the evidence would have been destroyed. So, yeah, don't do this. You made me do something that you shouldn't do. Thanks, guys, for teaching me that. Like, sometimes it's good. But like when they do it in this kind of format, I feel like it's not good to teach me how to break something. Okay, open the forensics marketing case in autopsy and browse the disk image that has been seized as evidence. Come on, babe, and make it hurt so good. Sometimes love don't be like it should, baby. All right. Oh, server manager. So we're going to use this autopsy, finally. That's a cool, I like the dopamine on it. It looks dope. Takes one to two minutes to open. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. You got to get up and stretch, man. Oh, oh. Come here. Isn't she so cute, guys? She's just so cute. She's so cute. Yes. Yeah. Want to be princess? Yeah. Are you a princess? Uh. All right. So, <clears throat> from the welcome dialog box, select the open case. Okay, in the open dialog box, browse to forensics marketing. Okay, select forensics tech marketing dot out. All right. So the one thing I do recommend, though, if you do get a Secret Labs chair, uh, don't get it in white. It scuffs super easily. Like, I think it looks gorgeous, but I would get a darker one. But that's just me. Uh, so that way I don't get scuffs and stuff on it, and they're visible for the most part. Oh, what is this? Okay. This looks like a similar setup to something else I've used before. Uh, but I can't remember which program. Okay, autopsy identifies many critical portions of the storage media for you. You may briefly examine the following components. Expand the data sources node. Data sources node. Then select the marketing.vhd. In lower pane, select the hex tab. Lower pane. Hex tab. I can't select the hex tab. This is the master boot record residing in the first. Okay, now I can select the hex tab. Residing in the first 512 bytes sector on the disk. Expand the marketing.vhd. Okay. Uh, we're gonna select volume two. Okay, this is a system volume is normally hidden from view. Observe that the initial string of hex characters uh, identifies the partition type as NTFS. Hex characters. Initial string. Yeah, no, that's just metadata. Um, oh, they're talking right here. Okay. Okay, okay. 
So select volume three. This is the boot volume. Uh, hosting the operating system file and application plus user data. Expand the folders to users. Let's see what we got here. Where are my users? Users. Um, oh, we can do it from here. Users. Viral. Downloads. Okay, we're in downloads. You can see the symbolic link for the current directory and parent directory plus the default view settings configuration file, but there are no download files present. Okay. You are using up a lot of space. See your results. Let's see results. Oh, 2009 looks a little wild. 2017 looks the wildest. That's really cool. Oh, there's the XIF. Okay, there's the XIF metadata. Mm. Under the encryption detected. Encryption nodes, the presence of encrypted files on the suspect location could be a red flag. Your installed programs. date and time.
Gotcha. So yeah, a lot of cool stuff in here. Autopsy is pretty nice. I like the format. I like the ability for it to make the timelines, tell you when they started doing all this crazy stuff. <clears throat> very, very informative, very straightforward. You can, I can respect that. So we're going to browse activity timeline. Viewing the timeline of file activity might also help reconstruct the pattern of events. So, oh, I just was early on the timeline button. Oops. Oh, wait, did I already do that? Hang on. Did I not delete it? Uh -huh. Let's, let's do things out of this. Let's do this. So we're going to maximize the window on timeline. Uh, select GMT UTC. So that's based, right now it's based on local time zone. We change it to this. But that's assuming that, I don't know, if they set up their computer correctly with the correct time and everything. Some people don't do that. <laughs> All right, right click the long bar for 2017. Select zoom into time range. into April. All right. Wow. All right. All right. Now we're going to zoom into time range on the 29th. What the heck happened? I hit zoom into time range on the 29th. Oh, these are the hours. Oh. I was thinking those are days. I was like, why do you keep going? Okay. It's based on a 24 hour period. Oh.
All right. All right, so we're zooming into the 14 hour, so 2 p.m. So military time for you guys is based off of a 24 hour period. So what I normally do to determine the time past 12, right? Subtract 12. So from whatever the higher number is. So for example, if it is 1300, you subtract 12, that makes 1 p.m., right? 1400 minus 12 makes 2 p.m. So that's how I normally do it. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> and a new day always starts at balls, um, which is 0, 0, 0, 0. It goes up to 2359. I don't know why 59's on here. That's weird. But anyways, whatever. Oh, it's going by even number minutes. Okay. <clears throat> History back button in the upper left of the interface. I need to expand this to full screen. <laughs> Here we go. Sorry, guys. If you select a setting in error, use that to return to an earlier setting time. From the view mode list, select the list button. So fourteen forty-eight. Okay. Uh, view a new window. Okay. I was like, I'm having a heck of a time trying to read this email. Hi, I've installed update, but it didn't seem to do anything viral. Uh, hi, viral. Thanks for taking a look at our CRM product. I hope you're impressed with the feature set. I just want to make sure you're aware of necessary update that's just been made available. This will need to be installed straight away for you to make full use of the email tracking features. You can update here. Of course, you should check with your IT department before installing it. Can't be too careful. Speak soon, CRM sales guy. I mean, it seems like a legitimate kind of thing to expect. Um, it appears that the user viral was tricked by a phishing email into visiting this weird website. <laughs> 
and run a bit of malware in a file pretending to be the 7-zip compression utility. Also note in the string that 7z.exe was in the downloads folder, but as you saw, the downloads folder was empty, so it was deleted at some point. The loud interface makes it difficult to adjust column widths in this application. Use the full screen feature in the lab environment to show the maximum to maximize window space. Also, you can show the full text in a column by pointing to win a field to show its tooltip. Oh. Select the email message from viral 1448. It reads I've installed an update, but it didn't seem to do anything. Right click the message, choose extract file. All right. Oh crap. Right click, extract file, and then save it to desktop. Sent one, save. File extracted. Score. So yeah, autopsy, pretty nice. I like it. Let's see, answer the following final comprehensive questions to ensure that you recognize the importance of the activity steps and the uses for the information you have learned. Which of the following best describes why you must create an image of the hard disk drive instead of working with it directly? Um, <clears throat> to avoid an unintended change to the evidence. Which of the following answers best describes the purpose of hashes such as the MD5 sum hash command you used in the lab? Hashing proves that there has been no changes of data. Hashing insert pointers. Boom. Which of the following answers best describes why the timeline view and autopsy is useful? Displays the changes the digital forensics expert makes the data during the industry. Displays the chain of events, allowing the digital forensics expert to see a broader picture of what happened on the system. Displays the chain of evidence for the hard disk drive. Boom, 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 and boom. Wow. So I don't know if you guys heard about this, but apparently JBS meat producer got hit by cyber attack affecting North American and Australian operations. It's, it's not bad enough that, you know, dark side hacked our gas, but now meat production is being affected. So the, the dark side group, whether they realize it or not, they have set a precedence. Okay. Because they hacked this gas pipeline, um, and and you know caused that mass panic and stuff. Um, this is setting a precedence for copycatters for everybody. That oh hey we can hack these companies and get paid for it because they got paid. Um, I know Darkseid apologized that that wasn't their intent. They were trying to make money, but they have done something. They have like stepped over the boundary that has made it more lucrative for hackers to start targeting companies. And it doesn't matter what company it is. Um, I'm just looking at this JBS meat production, you know, that's, that's food, you know, um, what's to say that they aren't going to hack electrical, uh, nuclear power plants. I know there's, there's already like, cybersecurity stuff, but it's just like, man, you're, you're going after infrastructure at this point. You know, agriculture is infrastructure. Like, how do people survive without food? You know, if you're hacking uh, meat industry or uh, whatever, right, 
um, really big deal uh, to do something that that off the wall. Um, oh, what? I did that. I completed it. Yeah, it's completed. Why is it not showing up in other labs? Hang on. Okay, there we go. I was like, what? Um, so that's that's why, like, <clears throat> like I don't mind people hacking, um, but I think it should be done in a manner that is constructive, right? And that's why we, we, we say ethical hackers. And, like, if you guys really want to get your hacking on, I mean, there's plenty of places. Uh, hack the box dot eu they will let you guys hack whatever you want and i am more than willing to support this you sign in it's free you go in and you hack servers and stuff um so i would say go for it guys go wild this is this is a, a structured learning environment where you can learn how to hack they even give you the steps on on their older stuff and they got like ranging difficulties, like easy and hard mode. So if you're like a new hacker, don't know what you're doing, you can do an easy box. And uh, it's it's very informative and you learn a lot. But you're doing it ethically, right? Because hack the box is like, hey, hack our, our servers. We're okay with this. But when you start screwing around with like infrastructure or – messing with people's lives that's like you're crossing the line and you need to rethink where you're going because you might do something that will <clears throat> hurt people and maybe some of you don't care about people which that's that's your personal prerogative however um you should So let's go on to practice questions. All right, explaining digital forensics. Which of the following is an example of the process of identifying and deduplicating files and metadata to be stored for evidence in a trial? Which of the following is an example of the process of identifying and deduplicating? Forensics? Sounds legit. Sorry guys, my allergies are acting up. All right. Oh. What? It was e-discovery? Crap. Oh. So e-discovery is a means of filtering the relevant evidence produced from all the data gathered by a forensic examination and storing it in a database to format that to use as evidence in a trial. Legal hold refers to the fact that information may be relevant to a court case must be preserved. Forensics is the practice of collecting evidence from computer systems to an accepted standard in a court of law. Okay, fine. Due process is a term commonly used in common law to require that people only be convicted of crimes following the fair application of the laws of the land. Uh, security expert archives sensitive data that is crucial to a legal case involving a data breach. The court is holding the data due to its relevance the expert fully complies with any procedures as part of what legal process? The court is holding data due to its relevance. Expert fully complies with any procedures as part of what? It's a uh, due process. Expert archives. Well, hang on. That sounds like forensics. Oh, it was legal hold. Okay. 
Legal hold refers to information that the security expert must preserve, which may be relevant to a court case, regulators, or the industry's best practice may define the information that's subject to legal hold. Chain of custody reinforces the integrity and proper handling of evidence from collection to analysis to storage. And finally, to presentation. When security breaches go to trial, the chain of custody protects an organization against accusations of tampering with the evidence. Due process is a common law term used in the U.S. and United States and United Kingdom to require that people only be convicted of crimes following the fair application of the laws of the land. Forensics is the practice of collecting evidence from computer systems to a standard that a court of law will accept. Crap. A systems breach occurs at a manufacturer. The system in question contains highly valuable data. An engineer plans a live acquisition but ultimately is not successful. What reason may be stopping the engineer? So... Tools are not pre-installed or running. Boom. Specialist hardware or software tool can capture the contents of memory while the host is running live acquisition. This type of tool needs to be pre-installed or a standalone executable needs to be run as it requires a kernel mode driver to dump any data of interest. When a Windows host is in a sleep state, the system creates a hibernation file on disk in the root folder of the boot volume. This file is not a prerequisite for a live acquisition. When Windows encounters an unrecoverable kernel error, it can write contents of memory to a dump file. This file is not a prerequisite for a live acquisition. The page file, swap file, swap partition stores pages of memory in use that exceed the capacity of the host RAM modules. This file is not a prerequisite for a live acquisition. An engineer utilizes digital forensics for information gathering. While doing so, the first focus is counterintelligence. Which concepts does the engineer pursue? Uh, identification analysis of specific adversary attacks, build cybersecurity capabilities, configure and audit active logging systems. Oh, okay, so counterintelligence includes identification analysis of specific adversary tactics, techniques, and procedures. This information furthers the betterment of understanding adversary approaches that counterintelligence can note for monitoring. Counterintelligence provides information about how to configure and audit active logging systems so that they are most likely to capture evidence of attempted and, un and successful intrusions. Strategic intelligence is data and research that security specialists have analyzed to produce actionable insights that help to build mature cybersecurity capabilities. Strategic intelligence is information that security specialists have gathered through research and provides insights used to inform risk management and security control provisioning. All right, <clears throat> a system breach occurs at a retail distribution center. Data from a persistent disk is required as evidence. No right block or technology is available. Which approach does the security analyst use to require this disk? Snapshot. Boom. Snapshot is a live acquisition image of a persistent disk. It may have less validity than an image taken from a device using a write blocker technology. Fragments on a disk might represent deleted or overwritten files. The process of recovering them is carving. Cache can refer either to hardware components or software. The system uses a software-based cache in the file system, and when needed, the admin can acquire it as part of a disk image. Artifacts refer to any type of data that is not part of mainstream data structures of an operating system. An engineer retrieves data for a legal investigation related to an internal fraud case. The data in question is from an NTFS volume. What will the engineer have to consider when NTFS with NTFS when documenting a data timeline? The UTC time. NTFS uses UTC internally. When collecting evidence, it is vital to establish a procedure to calculate a timestamp and note differences between local system time and UTC. 
Many operating systems and file systems record timestamps as local system time, making it easy to document a data timeline. Most computers have the clock configured to synchronize to a network time protocol server. Closely synchronized time is important for authentication and audit systems to work pro properly. Local time is the time within a particular time zone, which will be offset from UTC by several hours, or in some cases, half hours. Local time, time offset may also vary if a seasonal daylight savings time is in place. All right, there we go. People trying to offer me jobs. Oh, I appreciate it, but I'm not interested. <clears throat> All right, continue. Let's do that. Let's exit out of that. So a cloud server has been breached. The organization realizes that data acquisition differs in the cloud when compared to on-premises. What roadblocks may the organization have to consider when considering data? Um, jurisdiction and notification laws. Really? Okay. Um, the on-demand nature of cloud services means that instances are often created and destroyed again with no real opportunity for forensic recovery of any data jurisdiction and data sovereignty may restrict what evidence the CSP is willing to release to the organization, cloud service provider. Uh, chain of custody issues are complex as it may have to rely on the cloud service provider to select and package data for the organization. If the cloud service provider is a data processor, it will be bound by data breach notification laws and regulations. The issue does not relate to the acquisition of data. Okay. Which term defines the practice of collecting evidence from computer systems to an accepted standard in a court of law? Forensics. Yes, finally. Okay, so computer forensics is the practice of collecting evidence from computer systems to an accepted standard in a court of law. Due process is a common law term used in the U.S. and the United or United States and the United Kingdom, which requires that people only be convicted of crimes following the fair application of the laws of the land. E-discovery is a means of filtering the re relevant evidence produced from all the data gathered by a forensic examination, storing it in a database. In a format to use as evidence in trial, legal hold refers to the fact that information that may be relevant to a court case must be preserved. An engineer plans to acquire data from a disk. The disk is connected to the forensics workstation and is ready for the engineer, which steps indicate a correct order of acquisition as they relate to integrity and non-repudiation. Oh, it was A. 
So in the correct step, the engineer makes a cryptographic hash of the disk media using either the MD5 or SHA hashing function. The output of the function is a checksum. In the correct second step, the engineer makes a bit by bit copy of the media using the imaging utility. In the third step, the engineer makes a second hash of the image, which should match the original hash of the media. In the correct fourth step, the engineer makes a copy of the reference image and then validates again by the checksum. The engineer then performs an analysis of the copy. Hmm. A system breach occurs at a financial organization. The system in question contains highly valuable data. When performing data acquisition for an investigation, which components does an engineer acquire first? I would say RAM. Really? Disk controller cache? Crap. The order of volatility outlines a general list of which compares uh, which components the engineer should examine the data. The engineer should first examine CPU registers and cache memory, including cache and disk controllers and GPUs. So disk controller cache. Engineers should acquire contents of the known persistent mem system memory RAM, including routing tables, ARP caches, processing tables, and kernel after any cache memory. So cache first. Uh, the engineer performs data acquisition on persistent mass storage devices after any available system caches or memory. This includes temporary files such as those found in the browser cache. So disk, then browser, then RAM, then SSD data. Okay. Well, that sucks. Hooray! I did horrible. Look at me not go places. All right. Explain risk management processes and concepts. Most organizations have formal risk management policies and processes. Is the risk worth the reward? Ugh. Both to meet compliance requirements and to make the business secure. These policies and processes are usually driven by frameworks and come with some standard terminology to describe factors and procedures within the overall process. It is vital that you be able to summarize key concepts of risk management so that you can participate in these important assessments. Okay, so risk management is a process for identifying, assessing, and mitigating vulnerabilities and threats to the essential functions that a business must perform to serve its customers. You can think of this process as being performed over five phases. So number one, we want to identify mission essential functions. Mitigating risk can involve a large amount of expenditure. So it's important to focus efforts. Effective risk management must focus on mission essential functions that could cause the whole business to fail if they are not performed. Part of this process involves identifying critical systems and assets that support these functions. Two, identify vulnerabilities for each function or workflow, starting with the most critical. Analyze systems and assets to discover and list any vulnerabilities or weaknesses to which they may be susceptible. Identify threats. For each function or workflow, identify the threat sources and the actors that may take advantage of or exploit or accidentally trigger vulnerabilities. Four, analyze business impacts, the likelihood of a vulnerability being activated as a security incident by a threat and the impact of that incident on critical systems are the factors used to assess risk. There are quantitative and qualitative methods of analyzing impacts and likelihood. Identify risk response for each risk. Identify possible countermeasures and assess the cost of deploying additional security controls. Most risks require some sort of mitigation, but other types of response might be more appropriate for certain types and level of risks. For each business process and threat, each threat, you must assess the degree of risk that exists. Calculating risk is complex, but the two main variables are likelihood and impact. Likelihood. Of occurrence is the probability of the threat being realized. Impact is the severity of the risk if realized as a security incident. This may be determined by factors such as the value of the asset, or the cost or of disruption if the asset is compromised. Risk management is complex and treated very different in companies and institutions of different sizes and with different regulatory and compliance requirements. Most companies will institute enterprise risk 
management policies and procedures based on frameworks such as NIST's risk management framework uh, or ISO 31K. These legislative and framework compliance requirements are often formalized as a risk and control self-assessment. An organization may also contract an external party to lead the process, in which case it is referred to as a risk and control assessment. A risk control self-assessment is an internal process undertaken by stakeholders to identify risks and the effectiveness with which controls mitigate those risks. Risk control self-assessments are often performed through questionnaires and workshops with department managers. The outcome of a risk control self-assessment is a report up to date Risk control self-assessment reports are critical to the external audit processes. Risk types. General types of risk can be identified as arising from specific threat and vulnerability scenarios. <clears throat> external threat actors are one highly visible Source of risk, you must also consider wider threats than those of cyber attack, natural disasters, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. I was going to go for like hurricanes or whatever. Anyways, illustrate the need to have IT systems and workflows that are resilient to widespread dislocation. The most critical type of impact is one that could lead to loss of life or critical injury. Definitely. The most obvious risks to life and safety come from natural disasters, person-made disasters, and accidents, such as fire. Internal. Internal risks come from assets and workflows that are owned and managed by your organization. When receiving internal risks, it is important to remember that these can be classed as malicious or accidental, non-malicious. Internal threats can include contractors who are granted temporary access Multi-party. Multi-party risk is where an adverse event impacts multiple organizations. Multi-party risk usually arises from supplier relationships. If a critical event disrupts a supplier or a customer, then your own organization will suffer. These are often described as ripple impacts. For example, if one of your top five customers goes out of business because of a data breach, your company will lose substantial revenue. Organizations in these supply chain relationships have an interest in promoting cybersecurity awareness and capability throughout the chain. As an illustration of how risk assessments can change in view a multi-party relationship, consider a company that makes wireless adapters originally for use with laptops in the original usage. That's just, shh. hey, hey, it's okay. It's going to be okay. All right. Sorry, guys. Hey, Paris, Paris, hey. What's wrong? Don't give me that. What's wrong? Hey, it's going to be fine. All right, so uh, as an illustration of how risk assessments can change. Dog. Yo, dog. Hey, come here. Paris. Shh. Shh. We know who it is. It's okay. It's okay. All right, in view of multi-party relationship, consider a company that makes wireless adapters. Originally for use with laptops in the original usage, the security of the firmware upgrade process is important, but it has no impact on life or safety. The company, however, earns a new contract to supply the adapters to provide connectivity for in-vehicle electronic systems. Unknown to the company, a weakness in the design of the in-vehicle system allows an adversary to use compromised wireless adapter firmware to affect the car's control systems the integrity of the upgrade process now has an impact on safety and is much higher risk
All right, intellectual property theft. Intellectual property is data. So we, we talked about IP before. Um, so this is intellectual property it means the businesses own data, brand, logo, whatever. So it is data of commercial value that is owned by the organization. So this can mean copyrighted material for retail, software, written work, video, music, product designs, patents. If IP data is exfiltrated, it will lose much of its commercial value. Losses can be very difficult to recover in territories where there are not strong legal protections. So I don't know if you guys have been reading recently about the guy who was doing the emulators. Uh, he recently went to court with Nintendo. Nintendo uh, got $2.1 million worth of damages because of him putting emulators on uh, the website for Nintendo products. But they uh, also stated, you know, he was making money off of this, which he did make money off of it. And then Nintendo said, well, that was $60 a game for us that we lost. And so the damages were just like, Nintendo was going to sue him for a whole lot more. The judge ruled $2.1 million was what he owed. That is, uh, that is some serious intellectual property theft right there. Um, uh, is it sad? I would say yes in the aspect that Nintendo has been holding all their like classics hostage uh, to us. Um, that, is, that is a frustrating aspect of it because like to get games on the Switch that I want to play that are classics – um, it was very difficult during that time. And so when the emulator software uh, and MU Paradise and all those guys came out, um, it was like, oh, I can play Pokemon Blue again. Or, oh, hey, like I can play like all these classics. And I feel like this is a wake-up call for Nintendo to start pushing their products onto other devices besides what they have. I know they try and do the whole niche thing uh, where they say, well, no, uh, we want it only on Nintendo systems. But I think they're starting to see how they can branch out and get other parties to jump in on the Switch. And hopefully, I'm hoping that Nintendo will start saying, well, we should jump out onto other systems. Um, and I think they've tried to do that with some of the phone games. I just wish they would do like classic um, games brought back to play on our phones like Pokemon Red and Go, uh, Pokemon Red, Pokemon Blue, um, Pokemon Yellow, uh, maybe not so much Yellow, Pokemon Red and Blue. Uh, could go back to the phone, you know, as an app. Um, but yeah, I just feel like right now, uh, yes, Nintendo was completely in the right, but they kind of force people to go that route because they decided to hold their intellectual property to themselves and not share. And, and that is one of the things that kind of frustrates me with Nintendo is that aspect. But I can also appreciate the fact that they're smart on the idea of limiting the amount of copies because then the value for you know cartridges goes down. The value for all that stuff kind of their property goes down, and and so I can respect them, but I can kind of be upset with them at the same time. You know, um, <clears throat> but yeah, Nintendo was completely in the right to sue the guy for they were they were trying to get a lot of money out of him. Like they were making uh, accusations of like four million dollars or more. But the judge ruled more for 2.1 million in the aspect of the costs and all that stuff. So software compliance licensing, breaking the terms of the end user licensing agreement uh, that imposes conditions on installation of the software can impose the computer owner to substantial fines. License issues are most likely to arise from shadow IT where users install software without change control approval. Um, that's another aspect of bring your own device that can be kind of dangerous is the fact that you can download uh, OS applications 
um, whatever, and you're not paying attention to what you're downloading sometimes, and you download something that could be malware, and you're putting it on your phone, and then you're linking your phone with the malware, uh, with company information. So bring your own device. I really don't uh, like as an idea personally. I think a lot of people would recommend against it. Um, <clears throat> legacy systems are a source of risk because they no longer receive security updates and because the expertise to maintain and then troubleshoot them is scarce resource. Um, that's, that's a good point too. Um, I've seen embedded systems uh, that are running on XP, Windows 7, um, and those kind of systems, they don't get any updates anymore. Like, it's Windows 10 now. That's what they're pushing. So, yeah, it's kind of leaves them susceptible to hacking. Um, let's see. Uh, if IP is exfiltrated, it will lose much of its own commercial value. Shadow IT hosts. Oh, I didn't read. I kind of skipped over the. So, network inventory management suites can report software installations on each host and correlate those with the number of license seats purchased. Licensing models can also be complex, especially where virtualization and the cloud are concerned. It is important to train the administrative staff on the specific license terms for each product. Quantitative risk assessment. There are quantitative and qualitative methods of performing risk assessment analysis to evaluate likelihood and impact. Quantitative risk assessment aims to assign concrete value to each risk factor. Single loss expectancy, the amount that would be lost in a single occurrence of the risk factor. This is determined by multiplying the value of the asset by an exposure factor. Exposure factor is a percentage of the asset value that would be lost. Analyze annualized loss expectancy. The amount that would be lost over the course of a year this is determined by multiplying the Single loss expectancy by the annualized rate of occurrence is important to realize the value of an asset does not refer solely to its material value. The two principal additional considerations are direct costs associated with the asset being compromised downtime and consequent costs to intangible assets such as the company's reputation, for example. The server may have a material cost of a few hundred dollars if the server were stolen. The costs incurred not being able to do business until it can be recovered or replaced could run to thousands of dollars in addition. A period of interruption where orders cannot be taken or go unfulfilled leads customers to look at alternative suppliers, resulting perhaps more thousands of lost sales and goodwill. The problem with quantitative risk assessment is that the process of determining and assigning these values is complex and time consuming. The accuracy of the values assigned is also difficult to determine without historical data. It is, has to be based on subjective guesswork. However, over time and experience, this approach can yield a detailed and sophisticated description of assets and risks and provide a sound basis for justifying and prioritizing security expenditure. Qualitative risk assessment. Qualitative risk assessment avoids the complexity of the quantitative approach and is focused on identifying significant risk factors. Qualitative approach seeks out people, uh, people's opinions of which risk factors are significant, assess and risks may be placed in simple categories. For example, uh, assets can be categorized as irreplaceable, high value, medium value, and low value. Risks could be categorized as one-off or recurring and as critical high, medium, and low probability. Another simple approach is the heat map or traffic light impact matrix for each risk. A simple red, yellow, or green indicator can be put into each column to represent the severity of the risk, its likelihood, cost controls, and so on. This approach is simplistic, but does give an immediate impression of where efforts should be concentrated to improve security. Uh. Do you want to you uh, No, I am good. You sound good. Uh. You don't sound good. Actually, both right. They were so much good. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to need these for a tape? <clears throat> Where's the white vinegar? I don't have like a small thing of it. 
Where's your where the guns go? Sorry about that, guys. Let's see what we got. All right, so FIPS 199 discusses how to apply security categorizations to information systems based on the impact that a breach of confidentiality, integrity, or availability would have on the organization as a whole. Potential impacts can be classified as low, minor damage, or loss to an asset, or loss of performance. Through essential functions remain up though essential functions remain optional. Moderate uh, significant damage or loss to assets or performance, high major damage or loss of the inability to perform one or more essential functions. Risk management strategies. The result of a quantitative or qualitative analysis, <coughs> <coughs> sorry guys, is a measure of inherent risk. Inherent risk, is the level of risk before any type of mitigation has been attempted. In theory, security controls or countermeasures could be introduced to address every risk factor. The difficulty is that security controls can be expensive. So you must balance the cost of the control with the cost associated with the risk. It is not possible to eliminate risk. Rather than aim is to mitigate risk factors to the point where the organization is exposed to only to a level of risk that it can afford. The overall status of risk management is referred to as risk posture. Risk posture shows which risk response options can be identified and prioritized. For example, you might identify the following priorities. Regulatory requirements to deploy security controls and make dem demonstrable efforts to reduce risk. Examples of legislation and regulation that mandate risk controls such as SOX, HIPAA, 
Graham Leach, Billy, the Homeland Security Act, PCI, DSS regulations and various personal data protection measures. High value asset, regardless of the likelihood of threat. Threats with high likelihood, that is high ARO. Uh, procedures, equipments, or software that increase the likelihood of threats. For example, legacy leg applications, lack of user training, old software versions, unpatched software, running unnecessary services, not having audit procedures in place and so on. And the quantitative approach, return on security investment can be determined by calculating a new ALE based on the reduction in loss with, that will be created by <clears throat> security controls introduced. The formula for calculating return on security investment is ALE minus ALEM minus cost solution divided by cost solution where ALE is the ALE before controls and ALEM is after controls. Risk mitigation or remediation is overall process of reducing exposure to or the effects of risk factors. If you deploy a countermeasure that reduces exposure to a threat or vulnerability that is risk deterrence or reduction, risk reduction refers to controls that can either make a risk incident less likely or less costly or perhaps both. For example, if fire is a threat, policy strictly controlling the use of flammable materials on site reduces likelihood while a system of Alarms and sprinklers reduces impact by hopefully containing any incident to a small area. Another example is off-site data backup, which provides a remediation option in the event of servers being destroyed by fire. Nice. Risk avoidance and risk transference. <clears throat> avoidance means that you stop doing the activity that is risk-bearing. For example, a company may develop an in-house application for managing inventory and then try to sell it if while selling it, the application is discovered to have numerous security vulnerabilities that generate complaints and threats of legal action. The company may make the decision that the cost of maintaining the security of the software is not worth the revenue and withdraw it from sale. Obviously, this would generate considerable bad feelings among existing customers. Avoidance is not often a credible option. Transference or sharing means assigning risk to a third party, such as an insurance company or a contract with a supplier that defines liabilities. For example, a company could stop in-house maintenance for any commerce site and contract so the services to a third party who would be liable for any fraud or data theft. Specific cybersecurity insurance or cyber liability coverage protects against fines and liabilities arising from data breaches and DOS attacks. Note that in this sort of case, it is relatively simple to transfer the obvious risks, but risks to the company's reputation remain if a customer's credit card details are stolen because they are used, they use your unsecure e-commerce application. The customer won't care if you or a third party will nominally responsible for security. It is also likely unlikely that legal liabilities could be completely transferred in this way. For example, insurance terms are likely to require best practice risk controls been implemented. All right. <clears throat> I have been dethroned. It's the Game of Thrones, babe. So I, I tried to sit on the throne. I said not. And then you killed me. Yeah, I did. You murdered me. Yeah, I did. You're dead. I died. I died. Yeah. <laughs> So tomorrow you get back on my throne, doesn't mean you're like a white walker or something? Yeah. I am the the night king. That's right. That's right. I'm pale enough to pass for the white the night king. I mean he's got icicles that are white on his face. I'm stretching. I am stretching. Oh, my back. I am so old. I feel it. I feel it in my bones.
got sent to my dungeon. It's cooler down here, though, which makes my computers feel a little bit better about themselves. All right, I am going to go grab the rest of my stuff real quick. I'll be right back, guys. Be back. Leave messages from nobody.
Yeah, guys, I'm sorry. I got so tempted by uh, <clears throat> peanut butter <clears throat> apples. I don't know. I just so I just wanted it. It just looks so good. It looks so good. Yeah. Mmm. Mm. That is really good. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Guys, this is so good. I'm sorry. Oh. All right. Yeah. Oh, man. Gosh. I am so obsessed with this. Uh, so pink lady apples plus, uh, plus peanut butter is a really addictive snack. I got a crunchy peanut butter. So you got the chunks in it. Mm-hmm. Mm <laughs> okay. I can do this. Oh. So, <clears throat> you can never take risk to zero. So part of risk posture is concerned with managing what risks remain. So when you get in your car every day, you drive, you accept the risk of somebody actually hitting you or you going off the road or your car exploding or I don't know, whatever. You get run over by a semi truck or you run over somebody with a semi truck i don't know take your pick but there's always risk with driving and so you accept that there's always risk with going on the internet and downloading things for free so every company realizes that hey we are a risk we are at risk every day hackers insider threats upset ex-employees um, anonymous, I don't know, dark side, name your pick, pick your poison, you name it, it's out there. So a business has to accept that there's that risk, right? And that's where we go into risk excel acceptance or tolerance. So <clears throat> there are no countermeasures are put in place 
because the level of risk does not justify the cost. Like uh, going swimming in the ocean, you might get attacked by a shark, sure, but it's relatively lower, statistically speaking, than getting into a car accident. Or because there will be unavoidable delay before the countermeasures are deployed. In this case, you should continue to risk monitor risk as opposed to ignoring it. Let's see. Let's see Google. All right. Risk. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I should look up death statistics. All right, uh, 2021. All right. <clears throat> um, CDC should usually have some pretty good stuff. Let's see, 2020 actually. Let's see, 2020. So during January to December 2020, the estimated 2020 age-related, age-adjusted death rate increased for the first time since 2017 with an increase 15.9% compared with 2019 from 715.2 to 828.7 deaths per 100,000 population. COVID-19 was an underlying or a contributing cause. What do I look like for mortality statistics? Boom. I'm going with 2020 because 2021 isn't over yet. Um, so in 2020, approximately 3.358, oh wow, occurred in the United States from 2019 to 2020. The estimated age adjusted to death rate increased. Let's see, do I have a visual representation of this? <clears throat> All right, so this is data from the CDC, Center for Disease Control. They're usually pretty good about giving us numbers, right? All right. Tests. Provisional number of leading underlying causes of death for 2020. Heart disease, cancer, COVID-19, unintentional injury, stroke, Chronic lower respiratory disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, influenza, pneumonia, kidney disease. That's pretty interesting. I thought COVID would be higher, but it's not. So yeah, inherent risk. Obviously, you want to continue monitoring for the risk. You don't just ignore it. It's still there, but you don't really pay for it with security. Residual risk and risk appetite. Where inherent risk is the risk before mitigation, residual risk is the likelihood and impact after specific mitigation, transference, or acceptance measures have been applied. Risk appetite is a strategic assessment of what level of risk tolerance is tolerable. Wait, what? Really? Uh, risk is tolerable. Uh, risk like appetite is broad in scope, where risk acceptance has the scope of a single system. Risk appetite has a project or institution wide scope. Risk appetite is constrained by regulation and compliance. Control risk. Control risk is a measure of how much less effective a security control has become over time. For example, antivirus became quite capable of detecting malware on the basis of signatures. <gasps> oh no, it's browning. I'm sorry guys, I'm gonna have to eat more. I can't have it brown. I have fresh apples, man. Mm. Mm. 
Follow me on Twitch for more recipes. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, control risk. Control risk is a measure of how much less effective a security control has become. Over time, for example, antivirus became quite capable of detecting malware on the basis of signatures, then less effective as threat actors started to obfuscate code. Control risk can also refer a security control that was never effective in mitigating inherent risk. This illustrates the point that risk management is an ongoing process requiring continual reassessment and reprioritization. Reprioritization. <clears throat> risk awareness. To ensure that the business stakeholders understand each risk scenario, you should articulate it such that the cause and effect can clearly be understood by the owner of the asset. A denial of service risk should be put into plain language that describes how the risk would occur and, as a result, what access is being denied to whom and the effect to the business. For example, as a result of malicious or hacking activity against the public website, the site may become overloaded, preventing clients from accessing their client order accounts. This will result in loss of sales from so many hours and a potential loss of revenue of so many dollars. A risk register is a document showing the results of risk assessments in a comprehensible format. The register may resemble the heat map risk matrix shown earlier, with columns for impacts and likelihood ratings. Data of identification description countermeasures, owner route for escalation and status. Risk registers are also commonly depicted as scatter plot graphs where impact and likelihood are each in access and the plot point is associated with a legend. That includes more information about the nature of the plot of risk. A risk register should be shared between stakeholders, managers, senior technicians, so they understand the risks associated with the workflows that they manage. Ba-boom, I hit my goal for the day. Look at me go. What areas of a business or workflow must you examine to assess multi-party risk? Uh, basically, every party that's involved, uh, multiple companies, personnel, you need to examine supply chain dependencies to identify how problems with one or more suppliers would impact your business. You also need to ex examine customer relationships to determine what liabilities you have in the event of an incident impacting your ability to supply a product or service and what impact disruption of important customer accounts would have should cyber incidents disrupt their business. Kind of. What risk type arises from shadow IT? Inherent risk. Shadow IT is the deployment of hardware, software, or cloud services without the sanction of the system owner. The system owner typically be liable for software compliance licensing risks. Eh. Oh, yes. Give me some of that peanut butter. Mm. Metrics could be used to make a quantitative calculation of risk due to a specific threat to a specific function or asset that annualized operation risk associated with the product, single loss expectancy or annual loss expectancy. Uh, ALE is SLE multiplied by. So annual loss expectancy is 
single loss expectancy multiplied by the annual rate of occurrence. Kind of? I, I don't know. What factors determine the selection of security controls in terms of overall budget? The risk occurrence, how often that risk occurs and whether it's worth the cost to use that security measure. <laughs> the risk is determined by impact and likelihood compared to the cost of the control. This metric can be calculated as return on security investment. What kind of mitigation option is offered by purchasing insurance? Mitigation option. Um, compensation for data that is lost, stolen. Mm. Risk transference. No. It is a compilation of all risks associated with your business. A document highlighting the results of risk assessments in an easily comprehensible format. Mm -hmm. Controlling risk is the ability to control the risk, to <clears throat> have a handle on the risk associated. I don't know. Control risk arises when a security control is ineffective at mitigating the impact or likelihood of the risk factor it was deployed to mitigate. The control might not work as hoped, or it might become less effective over time. Yeah, no, I didn't get that right at all. Mm -hmm. Hooray, I'm just mediocre. <clears throat> what is going on? Oh, they have to wear masks on the boat? That sucks.
All right. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. I got it all wrapped up in news. All right. You are a new security engineer hired to work under the company's chief information security offer, officer. Your company is dealing with remote network attacks that are targeting the company's intellectual property. The company is evaluating a next generation security information and event management solution from a major cybersecurity company to better addressing ongoing attacks. The next generation security information event management software incorporate features the company's existing security information event management does not have such features include user entity behavior analytics and security orchestration automation and response the chief information security officer has already met with senior executives during that meeting the cyber security division did not convince the chief financial officer that the company should authorize the expense of a new well ooh, that sucks Security information and event management. In contrast, the chief executive officer insists that the threats to the company's IP <clears throat> will be relentless. Your chief information security officer signs you to conduct a quantitative and qualitative risk analysis to help senior executives with the impact of the new security information event management solution. Use the following factors to conduct your analysis. The new security information event management will selection could hinge should hinge on return on security investment metric and not return on investment each incident has previously cost the company approximately fifty thousand dollars in multiple expenses primarily on lost productivity and engineering products the new security information event management should reduce ip exfiltration attempts by 80 percent or in other words preventing for the average of five attacks the company has suffered an average of five incidents attacks per year over the past 36 months the new security information event management will cost approximately 50,000 per year after factoring in all licensing fees Based on the scenario use the right in fields drop down sectors radio selectors to calculate the return on security investments of qualitative analysis and recommendation so we have five attacks per year Single loss of expectancy is 50,000. <clears> so our rate of occurrence times the single loss expectancy, make that 250. Oh. So it's fifty thousand. I don't know what our mitigation ratio percentage is. Is it 80%? Our solution is 50 grand. Um, <clears throat> uh, provide a risk management strategy action based on veracity. Just very information based on the impact problem. 
impact is high, medium. Okay, so let's see what I did wrong here. Step one, the inf this information is taken from the scenario. The annual rate of occurrence or amount of incidents was an average of five incidents per year. Single loss expectancy is the amount loss per incident. The total cost per incident was 50,000 per incident without including an exposure factor for simplicity. Annual loss expectancy is the amount loss per year and determined by multiple SLEs. So I got that part right. Oh, okay. So the annual loss expectancy modified. I didn't see that percentage sign. That's a, a whoops. I should have just put 80. Annual loss expectancy modified LM it minus the mit mitigation ratio or percentage of the figure that will reduce the threats. Scenario describes AALEM as 80%. All right. So step two. The top portion of the equation is 250,000. Okay. Oops. Times 0 0.80. Which equals two hundred thousand dollars. The amount the solution saves per year two hundred thousand minus the cost of the next gen uh, security information event management fifty grand equals one hundred fifty grand divide one hundred fifty grand by the cost of the next gen security information event management fifty thousand which equals three point zero zero or three hundred percent with a three hundred percent payback on the next gen security information event management. This is worthwhile investment. Solution will reduce incidents 80%, saving $200,000 a year based on Rossi. Oh, I forgot what that is. What is Rossi again? Something. And other factors in the scenario the company should take steps to mitigate risk, propose new security information event management solution. Avoidance is not an appropriate strategy. Company produces or relies on IP and cannot stop IP activity. Risk acceptance would mean continuing business as usual, which would permit costly ongoing IP attacks to continue. Risk transference would mean the company would out, could outsource security functions such as security information event management elsewhere. However, the company retains final responsibility over the IP and is not the best choice. The $200,000 saving provided by the next gen security information event management yields an annual 300% positive payback on investment. The best recommendation is to purchase the next gen uh, security information event management because it has a substantial overall positive impact. Moreover, the qualitative assessments of risk obtained from statements in the scenario indicate the IP theft will remain a high probability. Uh, issue for the foreseeable future, that's the cost of not taking action such as waiting, not purchasing a solution, conducting more analysis. Retaining the existing security information event management could prove to be more expensive. <clears throat> Step five, IP theft will be a high impact, high probability issue for the company. Statements within the scenario make it clear that IP theft has been expensive for the company, $50,000 per incident, making IP theft a high impact incident. The scenario also mentions that the company has suffered an average of five incidents per year over the past 36 months, and that the CEO believes that threats to the company's IP will be relentless. Such statements indicate that IP theft will remain a high probability event. I'm doing so bad on all of these. This is, this is terrifying. It's okay, I just got to take my test in like 15 days, and I'm doing horrible. Oh, hey, that's unplugged. All right, I'll be right back, guys.
All right. <clears throat> Oh, it's lunchtime. You know what? I think this is a good place to stop. I had to go make some lunch. I will see you guys later. I hope you have a great rest of your day.